The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Avantios Investments Limited, ABN 20096259979, AFSL 2455331, AIL, and Colonial First State Investments Limited, ABN 980023483522, AFSL 232468, CFSIL, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm David Pritchard, Executive Director of RAP at Colonial First State and responsible for our new innovative platform, CFS Edge. As technology progresses at rapid pace, the effective adoption of it has the potential to be a real game changer for practices, and undoubtedly it's going to play an increasingly important role in advice going forward. In this series, we uncover how technology can be used to drive competitive advantage, reimagine your client value proposition, and support continuous improvement. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Sasha Lutkowski, and I'm very excited to be hosting the final episode in our series. So in our previous episode, we were joined by Jerome Bewalder, Chief Operating Officer at CFS, and Peter Warren, Joint Managing Director at Finura. And that discussion delved into the world of AI. And today, Peter is back to continue that theme through the lens of tech stack, as well as people and culture. So to do that, we are joined by Drew Meredith, Director and Financial Advisor at Wattle Partners. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having me, and thanks for having me. (laughs) So, Drew, for a little bit of context, tell our listeners what exactly you do at Wattle Partners. Uh, so I'm still on the tools, probably more than more than I'd like to be at times. But uh, so I run Wattle Partners, which is a pretty fast growing uh, self licensed advice firm. Uh, we focus solely on retirement, which is kind of when we talk about how me, Pete and I met. It kind of came from that uh, switch in our business. I run it with my uh, business partner Jamie, um, and we've got a team of uh, there's four financial advisors, about twelve staff within the business now, as well. Brilliant. And Peter, just to uh, re- refresh our listeners on what it is that you do at Finora. Yeah, so we're an independent uh, wealth tech consulting firm. We work with IFAs, superannuation funds, and and institutions on all things to do with advice technology and the problems with they're within. Excellent. So we're going to delve into all of that today. Uh, so, uh, Drew, you hinted before that, you know, you and Peter have worked together. So how do you know each other? How do your businesses interact together? Apart from being Western Bulldog supporters, yeah, I think so. <laughs> for AFL fans, I know there's most, most of this goes to New South Wales, but uh, we we ran into, I think we ran into Peter at, at various points when we were trying to work on our tech and the delivery of advice. Um, and more recently, we made a pretty big switch in our business and started rather than being generalists, like I think a lot of financial advisors, financial planners are. We made a switch to focusing solely on retirement and we started to get a lot more leads than we could deal with, a lot more prospects, probably more prospects than we had in actual clients um, and realized it was very, it was very uh, going to be very difficult to be able to deal with those as well as servicing our existing clients and needed help with our tech basically. Um, and then through a couple of other events, uh, we're part of the uh, Insight Network as well. Part of the other, a few events we ran into Peter. Um, he did a presentation, I think, for something we were hosting, and I thought, actually, I think I should give Peter a call because I'm not getting much sleep at the moment, <laughs> and all I seem to do seem to be doing is admin, even as a financial advisor. So, that, I think that's where it originally started. That that be right, Pete? Yeah, it sounds about right. Sometimes you've got to eat your own cooking, don't you, Drew? So, yeah, with this stuff. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so, you know, your business, Drew, sort of made that switch to focus solely, well, not solely, I'm guessing, but focus on retirement. Then you've sort of been like, right, something needs to change in our tech stack. We can't necessarily achieve that goal at scale unless we get some assistance. And that's where Peter's firm come in. So how then do you work together? Um, what sort of things did you put in place from the beginning? Was it a very you know, sit down, let's work on a strategy type approach? Was it just, right, I'm doing too much admin, let's just solve that problem first? How did you approach that? I think it was, um, yeah, once we once we realized how much stuff we we're doing we didn't need to, uh, it was probably the most involved, much more involved than I thought. So my our practice manager here, Roshana, uh, and I had historically, you know, we ran a team that had 
three people in it about three or four years ago. Now we've tripled in size. Um, we try to execute everything ourselves. You know, we try the latest Xplan update. We try and code. Explain templates, um, trying to add in new CRMs, use DocuSign, all these things, and did it all ourselves. Like I think I hate saying things like bootstrapping, but tried to do that um, ourselves for a long period of time, and then realised uh, we needed a lot of help, and it was probably far more involved than what we thought, um, which is a testament to the the Fenura team. So it started off with a massive review of everything we were doing, kind of costing up all the different tech we had in place, but then not just looking at that and looking at what tech you could use to replace it, but looking at everything that was happening within the business. So not identifying, but we knew what some of our bottlenecks were. So dealing with prospects, making sure they're all getting the same experience, and then making sure we were, we, our, our ongoing advice service was pretty well streamlined through templates and wizards. But how do you deal with both at the same time? Um, and involved, I think, so Danny, one of Pete's team, Danny found a whole heap of bottlenecks and, and potential risks and uh, you know, double entering uh, and these sort of issues within our what we were using at the moment um, and gave us a yeah, massive presentation and has been working with us for about six, seven months to execute it, um, which helped a lot. As you can imagine, an advisor trying to execute something new without that little bit of pressure, um, <laughs> it was probably the most important part. You know, we, we even find it for Nero just challenging to be you know, right across all the technology, right across all the things that are happening in our space. And if you think about financial advisors, they are, you know, they're like GPs on steroids almost when it comes to trying to run a business because you you, you have that added complexity of the nuances of financial advice, that keeping up to date with the regulatory side, the investment side, which we don't even talk about in our, in our world. Um, it is really unrealistic to think that small business owners can just run tech projects beautifully, seamlessly. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of Drew broke down his experience what the process was and you know some of the things that you said you know you realize how much stuff you were doing that you didn't need to do and then getting that overview of everything that happens in your business at a very granular level and realizing that it's much more involved than maybe you thought in in the first instance so peter what does the process look like in general when you get into an advice practice and you start looking under the hood what what is the process from your end? You know, obviously you start doing that business analysis, and then then w- when does it generally go from there? Yeah, look, it, it starts a bit sooner actually. So one of the really important things we try to do is get a really clear north star established with the business owners and the shareholders about what they're looking to achieve. So it was really easy with Waddle because um, Drew and the team were pretty clear on what the challenge was, and it's an en- enviable challenge to have more clients and prospects to know what to do with. So we were essentially trying to learn how to suck a tennis ball through a hose. That was sort of basically where we were at, and we had to build a bigger pipe. So that was great. So we had a real benchmark and a, cl- a clarity of, I guess, decision-making by- from which we could work on for everything moving forward. So um, once we sort of got clarity on that, we-, we then sort of worked out, okay, well, what are the contributing factors to achieving that goal? And w- w- you know, for what all was really a couple of clear things for us was um, lead management, um, manual and repetitive task and data entry workflows, uh, advice production, and then on the back end, some data management stuff. They were the clear things we had to solve for Waddle. Um, there can be other businesses perhaps that are more mature than Waddle and are at the same growth rate. They'll have a bunch of other different problems if you look to solve um, where you know you might have an owner selling or something like that and we've got to get the business fit for sale. So it really does depend, Sasha, on what are those business priorities. And something um, I've tried to really focus on is just having that really honest conversation with the business owner about what are we, what is this business looking to achieve in three or five years? And really the tech should just be in service of that. And then, yeah, trying to look three years ahead. Um, and yeah, I think that was probably the hardest part. But we're, when Pete walked in, we, we'd been doing this for two or three years in terms of specializing yeah. and have this opportunity due to the, the, the potential in our business that we think we could be national. And then when you think about that, it gives you a different view on what, what's fit for purpose for your tech stack. Yeah, absolutely. So what about then specifically in Waddle's example, Drew, what challenges did you find in the process of just embedding some of these changes into your business? I think the first part was probably we'd um, not invested enough in our workflow in the past. So this, this if it was just a replacing our tech stack, I'm sure Pete would say we would have finished that in six weeks. But we redesigned every part of our process. We've actually split our teams. And at, while we've been doing this, we've added, f- I think, four new team members. So we've had to change everything on the fly. Um, we've separated our teams, which gives 
easy, you know, more clear responsibility between each, you know, a power planning group and an advice group and an administration group. Um, and I think the hardest, the the hardest parts were resourcing it appropriately. Um, you think it's just a plug in and go. So Roshana at the time was still on the tools. She was still dealing with clients um, or speaking to clients and doing multiple things. Uh, so pretty quickly realized she just had to dedicate all her time to this because we're adding several new um, tech platforms, some integrations between them at the same time. Um, and I think in advice, one of the other things would be sometimes getting the full team too involved, if that if that makes sense. We love opinions, um, <laughs> but it can it, when the agenda is incredibly broad or broad, and you do are talking about something that can be like uh, such a I think it's a lightning rod like this. It's having the team involved and along on the journey, but not necessarily um, taking all all the input and trying to because you you never better please everyone within this business, and it has to fit what your business goals are, not necessarily people's background and experience and where they've been before. Yeah, and I think that's that's part of the key is, you know, and and Peter mentioned it before as well, is really sitting down and getting a handle on what the business priority is, making sure that North Star is very, very transparent and very obvious. That way everyone is aligned to that same goal. Even if they've got differing opinions, that's the goal. That's always the goal. And that has to be very, very clear when you're doing something like this, I imagine. So Peter, you know, working with all the firms you've worked with on getting their wealth tech up to speed, what challenges do you see firms facing? Um, I think Drew touched on it before. It's it's definitely the resourcing side. So, you know, we're, we're pretty intensive, as Drew mentioned. Like, we're pretty hands-on project managing with businesses. But frankly, for every hour we spend, the client would probably spend two on terms of their actual efforts and doing some of the hard work, depending on what the what the issues particularly are, because there's just some things you can't outsource. You need to work out, you know, what you're doing yourself. So I think that thoughtful allocation of time and resources and important and under, and forgotten part. So quite often a lot of business owners will say to me, well, what's this all going to cost? And I said, actually, it's not really the cash, it's the hours. And so you have to have the courage and conviction to be able to free up someone in your team to focus on this so they don't burn out. So I would also suggest the other issue is businesses are trying to do too much at one time. So I think we were sort of lucky with Waddle in the sense that it was an organic growth issue where we do have a lot of clients that are going through mergers and acquisitions where we've got M&A issues getting in the way of the tech and trying to do this sort of stuff whilst you've got other big ticket items happening in the business may not be a good idea. So this is why that whole uh, transparency piece is pretty important for us when we start working with a client. We've had a few situations where we kicked off tech reviews and a business owner said, oh, I've just signed a you know letter of intent to buy another business the same size of us. Is that going to impact this project? Uh, yeah, maybe, mate. Maybe a little. Yeah, maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the closer we are to the business owners and what's going on, um, the better we can probably get things right from the start. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so Drew, where in terms of where you're at in your journey of implementing, you know, different tech stacks, all that sort of thing, and I'm guessing it's not a, you know, one and done, right? It's not a set and forget. I'm guessing this is quite an ongoing um, process in your business. What results have you seen so far in implementing all these changes? Yeah, I think Jim, my business partner said it well the other day during one of our WIP meetings was that this this project is there to empower people with the technology. You know, not to to make it easier, and you know, it's not a, like a single source of information. Rather than, you know, a lot of the tech at the moment, you have to log into a platform, log into CRM, log into portfolio management. Like, is so many different logins. So, has it empowered the team? And I think it definitely has. And then at the other end, has it empowered the client? And like, what the what we've been delivering physically to clients, which for retirees, it's okay; they don't mind physical things, uh, but. But physically and digitally to the clients is also improving their, I think, their kind of relationship with us at the same time. Um, but more broadly, like in our, in our head, you assume it's going to be incredibly expensive to do something like this, like the the cost of where you're investing your, your tech spend. It actually ends up being, in our experience, about the same, maybe, maybe slightly higher and almost better use. We're about to plug in the final part of it because there's been some additional integrations. And I think that's the benefit of having that North Star is working out which integrations you need and, and thinking about it the entire process. Whereas if I did it myself, the whole thing would have blown up <laughs> already by now. Um, and I think it's just giving us all, uh, we've got better confidence. And for us, we've got much better reporting um, in terms of where things are sitting at, where we're sitting on, if it's if it's prospect, prospect clients, if it's 
um, OFAs, if it's you know, tracking where SOAs are in the process um, as a, at a management level, significantly better than we had before. Would you say that the majority of the tools that you've implemented have been AI-based or are they a bit of everything across tech? What sort of tools have you implemented in Waddle? I, I think it's probably more, and Pete will probably answer this better better than I will, I think most of it's, there's there's small bits of automation that we've added and it depends what you consider AI, doesn't it? Like if you if your workflow automatically triggers into a new task, I'm assuming that's AI. If Netflix is recommending st- shows is AI, but yeah. it feels like it's not AI because it's just what you expect. Um, so I think most of it has been just finding uh, tools that are more fit for purpose for our business. Um, and then, yeah, automating and kind of having the the checklist and the processes. I think um, just cull that in a bit more, one of, the, one of the key things we do is sort of work out, you know, all the jobs we've done in the business, or we just call them jobs, and make sure we're doing using the right tool for that job. So what we were getting really clear on is what, what jobs happen in, Tool A versus Tool B, and and in some cases we were able to remove some solute systems completely as a result of that. So, um, in our experience, the more we can streamline and the less tech we use from a number of systems, we find better outcomes generally, particularly in small businesses. And that's what's going to create um, those sort of bigger, longer term gains that Drew is sort of alluding to. It's very hard to automate multiple, multiple tech solutions stitched together loosely. That's the reality. So big part of it was consolidation um, and a big part of it, frankly, was stuff the client doesn't see. It was just the back-end stuff, revenue management, workflows, like just frankly boring stuff, but that was consuming hours and hours every week of Waddle's time. What are some of the AI tools and processes that you're currently using in Waddle, Drew? I'd say we're kind of uh, broaching it so it would be softly, that we're trying it in different areas where, it's, where it can have the biggest bang for buck for us. One thing we're kind of, we're not really using it for is direct communication with clients yet. I don't think, you know, and people will have a view on that as well, that it's being used to support the business and our team internally to grow more efficiency, but not necessarily to communicate with the client and, re- and remove advisors um, or remove administrators. Uh, one big area, which I think a lot of people are using it for is content. So the ability, not not just to produce content, but to almost stream and, and repurpose. Um, and I, I write a lot, but using it to actually prompt and come up with ideas for that content, um, you can be more specific and your prompts can be more specific and it makes it much easier to build that marketing plan to then turn that into, as a lot of people are, so social posts, um, extensions of, of your marketing uh, that way. Um, we're using AI for a lot of our meetings at the same time. So uh, transcripts, action points are automatically shared straight out of it. Uh, and and then around we well there's always going to be a debate on this would be the automation of communications. So we've basically plot out the entire client experience from when they uh, contact Waddle or they listen to one of our podcasts or or something to when they sign a letter of proposal, and then we plot out the other side once they're a client. Um, and the uh, I think ninety ninety five percent of that onboarding process is automated. Using it where it gives us the the most benefit at the moment. Um, and I think there's so much opportunity. I know I talked to a lot of our other advisors that are using Copilot, um, and it, it can, I think, for a lot of planning, for it might be a question for Pete, that there's because we have so many legacy systems, it's it's hard to get the full benefit of AI across. So it's working within your framework and, and adding AI where it's beneficial rather than trying to throw some new pl- platform in there and, um, and blow yourself up or lose control. Yeah, I think it's the, the, there's two key themes that we keep coming back to in this series, and one of them is that all of these AIs, automations, business enhancements, tech stacks, all of that, their primary use is to support advisors and the business, not to take over, not to communicate directly with clients. It's all a support. It's all there to make our lives easier. And the other thing that keeps coming up is learning how to talk to these AIs, learning how yeah. to get them to speak your language, prompt engineering, right? They are two key themes that keep coming up in this, um, which, you know, I find just really interesting. And they're, and they're quite, if, if you keep them front of mind, I really think that it helps provide context to what AIs actually do and what they are for your business. What are some of the opportunities then with these AIs for advice practices? Yeah, so I, I think Drew and Waddle, have a, probably a prime example of where the most immediate opportunities are. So, um, you know, Waddle has a really sort of pretty sophisticated marketing 
strategy in place and it um, uses a an enterprise global CRM like Salesforce to deploy that and do it at scale. And um, I'd sort of encourage people to have a sticky beak on Waddle Socials because I think that's a good example of sort of how thorough they are with this stuff. Um, and, and the way Fenura has always been thinking about AI is we see it as a feature of products, not necessarily the product. So, for example, um, Salesforce have been deploying AI now at scale for quite a period of time, and that will continue to do so. And, and in fact, those businesses like Waddle are going to keep benefiting from that as those solutions become more and more mature. So, for example, um, AI inside of CRMs is really exciting because it actually can help with – it can clean up data automatically within a CRM. So, as that are a CRM, we use AI to clean our data and get it structured consistently across the board. And it does that beautifully. Awesome use case of AI. Not very sexy, but I can tell you it eliminates massive problems um, down the track with data management. Um, the second use case is absolutely on things like internal comms and capturing of do- data and knowledge. So, you know, I-, I still believe that advice businesses are in the knowledge business. We we sell knowledge and guidance to our clients. And so, um, as small businesses, the more we can do to capture knowledge, capture what we're doing with our clients across an organization and have the ability for staff to query that knowledge base that's collectively grown across the business using something like Microsoft Co- Copilot, it's incredibly powerful which is one of the reasons why we tell our client, Fenera's clients to record every internal meeting you do because everything you record then is captured forever and can be queried even by new employees that aren't part of Waddle right now. We'll be able to ask questions of what happened in Waddle in 2024 and we'll be able to find, you know, it's maybe not everything we want to know, Drew, but most things <laughs> we'll want future staff to know because there's going to be history and learnings there, right, that, that AI. So I feel like a lot of the stuff we're doing AI is just foundational for the future and there's probably a whole bunch of stuff we haven't even thought of yet in five or ten years' time, we'll go. We're really glad we recorded that because our people can access all this data. We can generate whatever we want in the future um, using this collective knowledge. So, if we're honest, they're the things that we're really looking at right now as those foundational bits. Excellent, excellent. What, what an excellent roundup. So, Drew, I'm going to put you on the other side of the fence. I know that you know running a business and all of that. Lots of opportunities now that you have implemented, you know, at least part of your plan. Oh, yeah. What challenges did you find in getting it done? Like we talked about resourcing and that, but is there anything other than resourcing that you found a a challenge that other advisors might as well? I think uh, part of it was the project was much bigger than we thought, Um, and we've probably take we've had to do demos on different technology platforms, and then naturally start dealing with the internal questions around how we're going to use them and how they're going to integrate. Um, and one, I, I think one issue that we're starting to look at, we've basically set up our own help desk is retired clients or a different cohort to a lot of clients. So a lot of the tech systems are set up beautifully for young people who are constantly on their phones, but, uh, we've had all kinds of issues with digital signing because a lot of our clients use iPads being, yeah. uh, you know, 60 plus. So it's making sure, um, the, the challenges make is the way we communicate and the way we execute and offer it to, to clients. And when we, and that's kind of the last, the final plugin, um, of ours, which, and part of that's, you know, getting a team ready, a team who is incredibly flat out dealing with, you know, prospects and ongoing clients at the same time, then becoming help desks to, uh, integrate new systems. Um, and I think, yeah, apart from time, it's just, it's, it was, it was a well needed review for our business. So, it was the challenge was not being as prepared as a business the, as what we what we should have been or could have been, uh, and I think that's probably the same story for a lot of I think financial advice firms. If but the good thing is realizing that you need to do something about it. Then they say that's the awareness. Step. Awareness is yeah. the first step. Yeah. <laughs> and, and con- my coach, footy coach, used to call it unconscious unconscious incompetence. And sort of yeah. <laughs> you need to be at. But I think you've got to you've got to have the scar tissue of going through this stuff. Unfortunately, there's no there's and and probably the hard lesson for everybody is there's, there's just no shortcuts. And I think a lot of businesses we do talk to, um, they will find try and go for the quick fix, which is like I oh, will just change this software, it will fix everything, and that's use CRM in. Yeah, and and then we just get called in eighteen months later, unplug it all because didn't work. So that can be that can set you back years. So sometimes it's the hard stuff that is sustainable. Yeah, and I think a lot of this also comes back to the people factor, which is again is something else that's come up in this podcast series as well. Not necessarily from this angle, but it's like the tools themselves, the the bots, the automations, the AIs, they're built really, really well. It's the people and the data getting plugged in that are often the challenging parts to um, you know clean the data, train your people to actually use these tools. I think that keeps coming up again and again as as one of the challenges. What about you know, 
ethical considerations of, of using AI in your business, Drew? Has that come up? Do you have um, a plan around that, a business philosophy around that? I think why initially we're we're wary of client communications using AI at, at the moment, so it's all internal, but I think that it can have a massive impact on culture. Uh, so it's this wariness that people will automatically think that their job's going to be replaced. If you can write uh, an, S- an SOA on ChatGPT um, without any client data, um, then what's a power planner supposed to do? So it's and so much of that becomes culture and and personnel driven or, or people driven, um, and not just you know being flippant with with comments around artificial intelligence. But how do you how do you embrace it? How do you ex- how do you encourage people uh, to use it as an extension of their their job? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, Peter, as as a wealth tech firm, are there any major ethical considerations that advisors really should be aware of in using? These sorts of texts. So, you know, we talk about things like Copilot and ChatGPT and la- you know, large language models and that um, generative AI. Is there anything really ethically that advisors should put top of mind there? Um, look, like of all things in life and business, just put yourself in the shoes of the customer and the, or the client. And so, if, if you would like transparency and disclosure from your professional services providers like accountants and lawyers that they use some generative AI to help them run their business, then probably a fair bet that your clients might like that level of disclosure. Um, that's probably the first thing. Second thing is, uh, I think um, that the the ethical considerations are probably just more to do with um, your responsibilities as an individual. So, you cannot get up in court and blame ChatGPT right. <laughs> for providing <laughs> bad advice. Yeah. Um, may trouble, may be a challenge to get a judge to believe that. So I, I sort of think they're just sort of standard things, right, that we've always got to contend with. Um, and so I, I think Drew's guidance there is really wise that just keep it maybe perhaps in the back end and, and keep the, anything directly facing the client at this stage just I've had a few conversations with advisors who have actually had a couple of their younger clients query them about, oh, well, is this advice just straight out chat GPT? So people are now perhaps becoming just suspicious about every bit of content they see now, what's real and what's not, just like video content, right? I mean, I, I think there's just an element here of where we're all going to get wary about what's real and what's not. And so um, we may end up in situations where we're disclosing what's human content and not AI because it's just so much more AI content now than human content. Oh, I don't know. Who knows where it's going to go? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I think that is a, a horror podcast with future. <laughs> That's a horror, a, fa- a fake news series, hey, fake news series. So look, we we touched on it briefly, and now I want to touch on it again. Is is culture right? Because I think there's this interesting cross section between people, culture, and technology. We've been skirting around it in in this in this episode so far. So uh, in one of the earlier episodes of this series, it was the one hosted by Jackie Clark the Director of Education at Colonial First State, she discussed culture and managing staff with Sue Viscovich from Elixir. So during that episode, there was this point made around influencing culture. And the point was, if you're a smaller firm with you know, four or five team members, the culture is largely organic, right? It comes directly from the principal. But as you grow larger, there is a bigger requirement to identify culture, you know, really define those company values. So Drew, I'll start with yourself. With with all of that in mind, what impact does a disruptive technology like AI have on the culture of an advice business, and in your, in your case, your advice business? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty strong on on having our values, and we built them and kind of review them, and they're part of our every staff review that we that we have regularly. Um, I think it can be it can be incredibly powerful, uh, and one of my biggest uh, things here was one of our. One of our values is actually to be innovative. I know, I think everyone says to be innovative, but to be truly innovative. And I think this is in def- difficult in financial advice, and it's probably reflective of how cultures need to change. That it, it, so much of advice has been about risk management. You know, since the Royal Commission, it's always been about you know disclosures. Just the, and yes, they're all they all need to be there. Um, but SOAs getting to 60, 80 pages long. And it's it's more about how do you switch from that mindset of managing risk when you know you're providing good advice to being truly innovative and, and using all the tools that are available to you to improve the client experience. So for us, I think it just it has to and I think Pete had it before, which is and quote Amazon, we're not we're not saying we're anything like Amazon, but just be obsessed with what the client's experience experiencing on the other end. Um, and I think that's what that's what advice businesses need to have. Whereas historically it's been a lot about compliance, covering ourselves and delivering 
delivering advice, but not necessarily doing well in the best possible way for, for clients. I think that comes to both AI and tech at the same time. Absolutely. And and Peter, what, what about from your angle, again, out of the wealth tech, what are you seeing in terms of culture change amongst advice practices with these quite disruptive technologies? Uh, it's a real mixed bag. I mean, there's a there's a product adoption curve, which is out there in the world that governs a lot of our buying behavior and the way we adopt technology. And we, we have this range from early adopters through to laggards and, you know, who's the person queuing for the latest iPhone versus someone that's still hanging on to their BlackBerry for dear life. I mean, they're sort of our two extremes. Um, and we, frankly, we find that in advice businesses. Um, and we'll have a spectrum of people in the same business on those curves. So you'll have some people who are really embracing and some people who really um, a good day for them is not turning on their computer at all. <laughs> you know, so um, our, our view of Fenura is to embrace those differences um, because actually often those people who aren't so crash hot in the tech are awesome at dealing with people and dealing with the soft skills that it's harder to train. So our view is um, embrace differences, but potentially put those, maybe some of those technology decisions and empower um, the decisions maybe in the hands of people who maybe traditionally wouldn't be decision makers and organizations, but are closer to the coalface. And I think one of the, the big risks that, that come with AI as well is that the you don't have any shortage of ideas anymore. You know, maybe advisors struggle to have new ideas. And now it's like you can ask any any system for new ideas, new brands, new this, new that. But ideas are great. It's giving people a space. It's the execution of those. Without mm-hmm. those, they can become, you know, distractions versus how do you actually execute meaningful changes? Um, I think it's that, that differentiation between having multiple, multiple ideas and being able to execute them that are relevant to your client and to your business and yeah, making sure you're not distracted. And for us, for culture-wise, but it has come with some skepticism. I thought there'd be more kind of, you know, the, um, I haven't had experience with old, older advisors, um, that there's kind of skepticism and wariness of of trying them out, whereas, you know, ten, the, the graduates coming out of this before are fully embracing it. So how do you encourage them? But don't, and don't, force them into it but how do you say how about you try this on chat or this on copilot or this on otter uh and and trying it little bits and encourage them to do that so leading that way rather than saying everyone should be doing this does that make sense yeah absolutely i think you know we we talked about the, the the culture the people you know how you actually integrate ai and other technologies into your business apart from those two factors which may be the only two defining factors but given you know you've got the experience of having integrated this into your business. Do you have any other tips for advisors that they should be aware of when trying to integrate these technologies into their business? Be patient. <laughs> do it yourself first. I've been the I've been the worst at it. Just do things that, you know, when when you're stuck on something, or we're always stuck in different areas, you know, do things yourself that that show the rest of the team that you're using it. Don't be afraid to have chat GPT open on your computer um and so other people can see it like don't hide it on you <laughs> uh and i think it's just like leading you yeah, know leading from the top um and and allowing people to make mistakes as well i think is is key that it's it's not going to be perfect they might try different things and so it's the encouragement and the lack of judgment at the end because we know there's going to be benefit there'll be benefit for their jobs hopefully it reduces stress uh, hopefully it helps the business scale and grow quickly and hopefully it gives a client, a, you know, we're able to deliver good advice to more more clients and do so efficiently. And that's what the the ultimate outcome is, what we're we're looking for. Absolutely. I'd like to, to ask Peter a question, which is, you know, at the moment we're sort of talking about from the context of firms with, you know, 10, 15 sort of employees, a little bit of a larger style firm. In your experience, how does a smaller firm, your one, two, three person sort of firms, up to say five people, is is their experience of integrating these technologies similar regardless of size or does a smaller business have to take other things into account when trying to integrate these technologies? Yeah, I mean, look, smaller businesses can definitely make decisions faster. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> so there's less concern on the I guess the change management people side, because you know, as we say, some of the, the board meets daily in a three man business. That's kind of how it works. Um, but but the, the the challenges with those businesses are often that, um, like it or not, there is key person dependency in there. Um, that everyone still has to, irrespective of the advice business, people still need to run all the same functions running a small business, irrespective. And so it, it will still come down to embedding 
change management will be st- will still be extremely challenging in a very small business. People will tend to just operate as independent entities and loose be loosely connected together in some way. In a small business is what we would tend to find with tech. I don't think there's necessarily, that's necessarily a problem though, because there's been we've seen plenty of examples of um, very small businesses, one two man advice businesses operate super lean on super high margins. But the common, the unique characteristic of those businesses, they will generally pick one very narrow set of technology that they work with and be pretty monogamous to that. They'll tend to use one platform, one advice tool, and double down on their productivity suite like Microsoft and never venture off that. They keep it really simple. So I, I don't think it's for me to say what's the right size business or not. Um, but I think if you are a very, very small business under seven advi- uh, seven staff, don't go and choose a tech stack that you would typically see in a ASX 200 company. <laughs> so, gentlemen, we're drawing to a close. Now, I just have one more question for each of you. So, Drew, I'll start with yourself. What has, in your opinion, been the single biggest benefit of implementing AI and other technologies to Wattle? To I think it's the uh, you know the the comfort of knowing that we're able to deal with our with prospects and take on new clients and know that the service level of our existing clients isn't dropping off. I think that would be the biggest one, and with that comes this benefit of you know management reporting, understanding where workflows are going. So it's like the, that's the detail, but the ultimate outcome is having confidence and and also knowing that you know this 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 what we've got set up is scalable. You know. With new advisors, we could triple the size of our practice and and not have to change our technology whatsoever. Um, I think that's where the where the real comment that that helps you sleep if you if you if you're not worried about yeah responding to queries or following up yeah. <laughs> oh, good. And so, Peter, final question for yourself is on the wealth tech side. What's your key piece of advice for firms who are looking to implement AI and other technologies into their business? Oh, it's going to be really boring, but it, it's actually getting the sim- the simple stuff right. So if if your if your data's crap, you know, and you know it's crap, it's in multiple systems, it's on desktops, it's all over the place. Don't even bother, frankly, because you're going to have a pretty poor experience, generally speaking, outside of using ChatGPT and different things like that. But if you're actually looking to deploy AI at scale across the business, you're not quite ready yet. So um, there's got to be a lot of hygiene work you've got to do. And our simple message on that one is get all your data, one core system, get the data nice and clean. It's going to be a boring process spending six months cleaning it up, but you know you've got to do it eventually. And then we can start exploring with the really cool stuff. So, um, and, and I think that has to be done irrespective because that, that data management issue is critical, regardless of whether you're looking to um, grow through acquisitions, you need good data to do that, you need because you're going to absorb other businesses in the future. Or if you're looking to sell in the next five years, no one's going to buy a business if the data is not clean, easily accessible and easy to manage. So um, that's going to be the boring one, but that's what you've got to do, guys. Sorry. <laughs> you got to start, start at the beginning. Always start at the beginning. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> no, that's been excellent. Thanks, um, Peter and Drew. Really appreciate you taking the time today and giving our listeners plenty to think about. I've really enjoyed being your host and I hope that everyone listening has got as much out of these conversations as I have. Thanks, Peter and Drew, for joining us and uh, thanks for listening. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.